Good morning. I'm Bill Allen. I'm one of your pastors here at First Methodist. And as I prayed about this message, I recognized that this would be the only time in my life that I would get to preach on the Great Commission. And I wondered, what could I do with this one opportunity? And I think the answer is that I need to give you as clear an understanding of what Jesus is saying to us in this gospel and how that relates to your very life as you sit there in the pew and how it relates to my life and the life of our church. And in addition to understanding that, you need to understand why we must respond to the Lord's instruction. And if we respond, what really happens in our lives and in the life of our church? So first, let's explore what it is that Jesus is actually telling us in this scripture. He's basically got two things for us. He says, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Now, isn't it a shame that he has to tell people that? I mean, think of his life. This fella has gone about preaching a new and amazing way to come into communion with the living God. He's done miracles. He's shown compassion. He's healed people. He's fed people. And then he said to his people, Hey, listen, y'all, we're going to Jerusalem, and they're going to execute me, they're going to crucify me, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And then he did it, and then he has to tell us that he's got authority. Isn't that amazing? It is the way God has made us. It is the way God made them. But Jesus does have authority. He has shown us. And then he gives very simple instructions. Go to the mountain, and I'll meet you there, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Now, the mountain has symbolism in Scripture. You know that Moses saw the burning bush on a mountain. Moses got the Ten Commandments on a mountain. Jesus preached his most memorable sermon at the top of a mountain. He was transfigured on a mountain. This is another way of saying to his people, look, I got something real important to tell you people, and I have got authority to tell you about it. And his instructions are very simple. He says, go. Bab go. Make disciples of them and baptize them. Now, go is a very simple, straightforward thing. It's an action word. He tells us, do something. Now, I've got good news for everybody. Our God knows us. He knows every one of us. He knows we've all got different talents because He gave us those talents. He knows some of us are young, some of us are older, some of us are strong, and some of us aren't so strong. Some of us are very wealthy, and some of us hardly have a thing. And God knows that. And so he knows all our responses are going to be different. He knows some of us can go far away. And he knows that the mission that some people will do will be to roll their wheelchair to a telephone and call a neighbor who is hurting and pray with them. And God knows that. He knows all of our responses will be different. But one thing is the same for all of us. God God, Jesus, has upped the ante. He's raised the bar. He's put a heavy responsibility, or really a light responsibility, on every shoulder. He has not said, when you get older, do this, or when you get younger, or when your health gets better, or when you get rich, do this. He said, do it. And there's something for everybody to do. And I want to talk about some of the wonderful things we're doing. For example... We're spreading Christianity in Pakistan. We've got this great thing where we're training Christians in Pakistan to go out and train other Christians and to teach. 
to teach adults and to teach children. Our children are praying for them. They pray for us. We're going into one of the most oppressive nations on earth that is more than 96% Muslim. Only 1% of the people in that nation are Christian. We're spreading Jesus' word wherever we can. We've got things close to home, like Neighbors in Action. You can go and work with the women and children in Port Houston. You can come to the basement and work with the street people, with Alexis and I, and, and, and uh, Ursula, and, and Louise, and, and Guy back there. There's so many things that you can do with this church. Not everybody can go on a trip to Honduras, or Nicaragua, or Colombia, or Cuba, but we are all the same in one way. Jesus has placed a responsibility on every one of us to use whatever resources, whatever time, whatever strength, whatever talents we have to live a life and mission. His instructions are very simple. When he says go, he is saying to you, to me, to Anne, to Andy, to every one of us, to participate in my kingdom. A life and mission is not something just that Anne has to do or Kristen has to do or Andy has to do. It is a responsibility that we all carry. And part of the reason I want to talk, I want to talk, well, I want to talk about why we need to do this. I asked Patty, my wife, so Patty, if I ask you, why do we have to respond to the Great Commission? She said, well, Bill, it's because Jesus says. It's a, that's nice, and it would be nice if I could just say, well, Jesus says to do it, and therefore y'all get with it. But it's not that, it's not that easy. The good news is God knows that he gave us a brain. He gave us hearts that allow us to do things of infinite beauty and compassion and love. But he also gave us the ability to make a decision and to ignore his instructions, to be lazy, to do great evil. He knows he's given us this tremendous capacity to participate in his kingdom in a real way. God understands us. But Jesus does have authority to give us this instruction. I look at this as something of a dividing point in our lives. In Luke chapter 12, verse 51, it actually says, Jesus came to divide us. About three weeks ago, Andy preached, I think, on the, the Gospel of James. No, it was Matthew 25. It was Matthew 25 where he talked about this. He talked about the the uh, sheep and the goats. And he said, it's such good news because what Jesus has said to us is that, gosh, if you help the least of these, you've done it to me. But at the same time, he said, if you've ignored the least of these, you've ignored me. That sounds bad. You don't want to ignore Jesus. This is a little part of the gospel, a little part of the gospel that Mother Teresa says she believes literally. Andy says, and I agree with him, this is really good news. This is good news because it's easy not to ignore the least of these because there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Our church is doing so many things. We have refugees that have come from all over the world, from Syria, from Africa, from all over the world, from Muslim countries, from Christian countries, but from, from places of oppression. And we're doing beautiful work with those people. And I'd like to show you a video that shows some of the folks that we are helping from around the world.
اخوتي وبنتان اخواتي عشنا لغاية ما طلعت الثورة ضد نظام الأسد عشنا حياة مرعبة جدا بالفترة هاي من 2011 لآخر 2012 وكنا من أول المعتقلين أنا وأخوتي حملة اعتقال ضد معارضين الأسد كنا نتعرض كل يوم للتعذيب وللقهر وللضرب وللموت كل 15 يوم 20 يوم بتدق علي أو بتجي اللي عندي لهون بتظل تسالني بدك بحاجة شيء بحاجة شيء بدك اي شيء بقول له الحمد لله رب العالمين مستورة من اي شغلة الشهر اللي فات انكسرت باجار البيت ينامون ضمن خيمة تمر يمر الطيران في السماء يخافون يخافون ويرتجفون ويسبحوا ويبكون كان لدي في ذلك الفترة في تلك الفترة استيقظنا ذات صباح واذ بعمر قطعة جليد قطعة ثلج لعدم وجود أي نوع من أنواع التدفئة كانوا يبكون طوال الليل The statistics are now that there's roughly 65 million displaced persons uh, about 5 million of them are from Syria and so when we are able to help somebody from a different country to come to our country and experience friendship and love in the way that we're able to do, it's a tremendously rewarding feeling. You know, it's the best feeling you can have is to love somebody and feel loved back. Breaks my heart what is going on in Syria, and I feel like I can't do anything about it. But if I can help one family here navigate all of the complexities of life of moving to the United States, and if I can help the children understand English better so they can succeed in school, and they can thrive, and they can come to love our country, then for me, that means maybe I can make some small difference. When the power was cut, we didn't find any people who were good and good. They came from the church and helped us with no need for it. They were very good and good. They didn't stop us with any other. من الأكل من الشرب من الألعاب للأولاد من الحلويات ما قصروا معنا أي خدمة شيء لشيء يعني ما كانوا يشروه عبيتهم تروح تنام. I had the awesome pleasure of hosting 107 people, refugees at Pullian Center. My heart was really broken for for so many of our, our refugee families because of course this is their second time at least going through this experience. These people lost their homes, not to Hurricane Harvey, but to a civil war where there was no FEMA, there was no government, there was no church, there was nobody to help them escape the hardship they were experiencing. It was especially good that our church was able to open up our facility again and help them. So many people did. I saw so many of our friends and members bringing food, bringing clothes, taking time to, to serve. It was, a, it was a really a great, wonderful experience. شغلة كبيرة 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 يعني كانوا يقولوا لنا إنه الأمريكان خامين طلعوا الأمريكان ذا طيبين طيبين لدرجة طرجة كانوا خير ناس وخير معينين إنهم فعلا طيبين ونحن نحبهم جميعا كانوا رائعين لا أستطيع أن أقول أكثر من ذلك شعرنا إننا في بيتنا ولم نشعر بأي فرق وكنا مرتاحين جدا وسعيدين وشكرا لك Jesus said, go to into the world and make disciples. That's what he's talking about. That is what he's talking about. Why must we respond to his instructions? Why is the story of the sheep and the goats good news, not bad news? It's because the need is great. There are 7.1 billion people on this earth. 1.3 billion of them live on less than $1 a day. 1.3 billion people do not have access to clean water. You should go on the World Vision website sometime and 
Look at the videos of children five years old walking two miles with a, with a bucket to get muddy water to take home so that they have something to drink. It's heartbreaking. The need is very great, and we are in mission all over the world and in this city. It's such an easy thing to do, to be part of what Jesus is doing in this world. One of the things I want you to hear is sort of my answer to the question, what happens when we do the right thing, when we do what Jesus has told us to do? Once upon a time, many years ago, I was driving to work. Now, most of y'all know that I'm a retired physician. I'm a pediatrician, okay? And I was on my way to see patients in the clinic. I was praying, and I got a strange, almost audible message. I heard that I have work for you in Mexico. Now, I thought I'd just eaten some bad tacos, probably, because, <laughs> because at the time, I spoke not a single word of Spanish, and that's the truth. I could say, I probably said Garcias instead of Gracias, and, you know, it was really bad. I didn't speak any Spanish. I'd never been to Mexico, and I really heard that message. And when I got to the clinic, about 10 minutes later, because I, I was close to where I was going, I walk in, and the nurse says, Bill, there's a man here with a sick child, but he doesn't have any appointment. And I said, this sick child. She said, hey, but he says he knows you. And I said, yeah, put him in a room, put him in a room. You know, and I go in into the room, and the child was sick, significantly. And the man says, I'm so sorry. Well, his name's Jerry. And he says, I don't have any insurance, and I don't have any money. And I said, doesn't matter. Let's see what the problem is and see if we can help. Well, we helped. She got well. She was probably going to get well anyway is the truth. <laughs> you know, but, but they thought I'd helped them. And the man says, well, I don't have any money. But, and he whipped out a little black book and said, but I leave mission trips to Mexico. Would you like to go to Mexico? Now, I'd had that happen about 10 minutes before. And, but, you know, I couldn't dodge it. They wouldn't let me dodge it. I said, when are you going? And he called off a date, and I said, ha-ha, I'm on call. That's what I said inside. <laughs> and I was. And he said, well, we can delay the trip a week. Are you on call the next week? He wouldn't let me out of it. So I had to go to my pastor. He, he stuck me with getting the transportation. I, got, I borrowed the church van. The pastor wasn't that crazy about it because it was un, unplanned. And then... I had to collect the team, and my son Scott, who was in the sixth grade, I, I could collect him pretty easy. And he, he recruited a kid from his class at school. That's the truth. And I was able to get our church secretary, who was somewhere over the age of 65, and the matriarch of our church, a saint named Ruth Young. And that was the team, me and Jerry and his daughter. And so we go 450 miles down into Mexico, but I left out a detail. Jerry made me get a trailer hitch put on the church van. I didn't tell the pastor about that. I just did it. <laughs> and I go over to his house, and he had borrowed a flatbed trailer, and they had been collecting clothing for the poor people in Mexico for weeks. They had washed it. They had sorted it. They had folded it and put it in bags. There were more than eight tons of used clothing. We drove down there 450 miles. They had rented an old concrete block building for revival at night, for a nighttime revival. It was a bar that they had rented. It had windows, but there was no glass in the windows. They just had cloth hanging over the windows and a cloth hanging over what they called the door. There was a light bulb that hung down from a cord, and that was the light in the place at night. And we ran extension cords from a pole for an amplifier so a teenage boy could play guitar. 
and they brought in some drums. And each night, we held a revival. The first night, Jerry preached to about 20 people. And after the service, he opened a couple of the bags and we let the people who were there choose two or three items of clothing. The next night, we preached to twice as many. The word got around. By the fifth night, we had more than 200 people in that worship service that were hearing the gospel. One of the nights, Jerry says to me, Bill, you're preaching tonight. Well, since I didn't speak any Spanish and since I'm a pediatrician, not a, not a professional pastor at that point, I was terrified, even more scared than today. You know? <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't speak any Spanish, so I'd say about a word in English. And Jerry would talk for five minutes. I have no idea what he told those people I was saying. <laughs> and that is the truth. The point of the story is it changed my life. And it changed Scott's life. The simple act of paying attention to the Great Commission, whether I wanted to or not, truthfully, changed my life. And it changed Scott's life. Within a year or two, Patty was coming to me and saying, you know, I think Scott's going to grow up and work for the church. Where should she get that? But she was right. He's graduated from seminary, and he's the youth pastor up at uh, First Methodist Fairfield. With Harvey, with the flood, his youth group was one of the first teams to go in and help muck out houses in Cyprus, where he had worked before he went to Fairfield. It changed our lives. What happens when we do what Jesus said? Now hear this, because this is the bottom line on this whole business. When you do what Jesus has claimed the authority to tell you to do, what are you going to get out of it? I will be with you until the end of an age, he says. Jesus comes. He comes. He is reliable. He does what he says he will do. He stands beside you. And if necessary, he stands in front of you. He is good on his promise. He has the authority to give us these instructions. And he's made a promise. He will come. He will stand beside you. He will help you. If your mission is rolling a wheelchair to the telephone and calling the hurting person, or if you're able to give money or whatever you're able to do, please do it. Because otherwise, I mean, you don't want to miss the greatest gift there is in life, which is to have Jesus Come and be part of your life and stand beside you for he is good on his promises. Amen. I want to say one more thing before, before we pray and that is that the things that happen at the church do not happen by magic. We need your help. We need your presence on our teams, in our missions, whether it's in the basement or helping with the refugees, or out of Port Houston. We need your presence, and you need to be present. And we also need your financial support to make all these wonderful things happen that Jesus has called us to do. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, I pray humbly that whatever words that are heard in this place that they are your words. That you have used this worship, that you will use this worship to move us and empower us to be part of your kingdom, to do your work, to carry the cross, to help those who are around us. Gracious God, we love you so much. And we give thanks for your presence in this church for more than 170 years. Give us the strength and the wisdom Show us the road that we may continue your mission in this world. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.